Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Torah Studies. This week is Parshas Re'ei. This week is also a very special Shabbos, We're blessing the month of Elul. You know it's hard to believe. Still in the middle of the enjoying the summer. And uh, the month of Elul is the month Chodesh Rachamim Vaslichot, the month of compassion and forgiveness. We're going to say, uh, blow the show for, prepare for Rosh Hashanah for a good year. As the Rebbe always mentions that this is the Melech Basadeh, the king is in the field. So we can have a head start. And um, today's topic, in fact, is about the portal to infinity. Why are so tiny detail, details important to such a mighty God? And uh, we're talking about the mitzvahs. I get this question a lot. People ask me, why is that important? I want to be a good Jew. I'm good at heart. I have my ways of connecting to do. Why is it important if I take this uh, to fill in and I wrap it this way and that way? If I put on uh, a light the Shabbat candles a minute earlier, a minute cannot be a minute later. Uh, why is that all these details in mitzvahs so important and um, so we have in our parsha an interesting verse uh, we begin with this verse what the Torah says and, and we're going to explain this verse and give us a little bit of understanding the deeper understanding behind all of these details in mitzvahs, why we do them, why are those details important. So let's begin. Yeah, this is one of the examples you're taking on Sukkot. We're having the, the, the four species and it, buying an esrog not a cheap thing. The Torah says take four different species and and it has to be carefully checked to make sure that every detail is okay, that is not a not missing a little bit. Again, isn't God busy with bigger things than all these tiny little details? Why are these two tiny little details important to Hashem? So we read in this week's Torah portion, the Torah says Everything that I am commanding you, be careful to fulfill it. Do not add to it and do not, sub- do not subtract from it. So all of these details are important. You understand why we cannot uh, subtract? But why can't we add also? And one thing we need to understand when we're talking about this, the mitzvahs, this is something that people ask. This is, uh, is one question that was asked by, uh, by Aaron Moss in uh, Chabad.org. And he was asked that question. Why does the Jewish religion seem to obsess over insignificant details? How much matzah do we eat? How much matzah do we have to eat? You know, if you've been to our Seder Pesach night, you can see when we make the bracha and the matzah, we sit down and we'll make sure we eat like a whole matzah or sometimes more to make sure to eat it in, an, in a certain amount of time, in three minutes, four minutes, whatever it is. Why is this so important? Which spoon did I use for milk and which for meat? What is the right way to tie my shoelaces? I don't know if you're aware of that. Yes, there is a right way and a wrong way to tie the shoelaces. You got to wear the right shoe first and the left shoe second, and then you tie the left shoe first, and and then you tie the right shoe second. All of these details. It seems to me that this misses the bigger picture by focusing on minutia. It is nitpicking 
what Jews call spirituality. Is this nitpicking what, what Jews call spirituality? And then he writes to him, I actually already sent, I sent you this question over a week ago and didn't receive a reply. Could it be that you have finally been asked a question that you, that you cannot answer? All right? So this is the question. This is the question that we get asked all the time. Now, before we get to the answer, we got to make sure also that in fact, it is uh, some people, when they hear certain details, what they need to do, and they uh, become obsessed with some details too much, that is also a, a reality. And so this also, we have to make sure that uh, when we're talking about the laws that we need to, to do, we need to do the laws that is necessary. Sometimes you can go beyond, like become uh, OCD about it, and that is a problem. And here, we bring an example from uh, Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. And one of his students writes, about the law, it says before you go to pray, you got to make sure that your body is clean. You have to check if you have to go to use the restroom and so on. And it says that some people become obsessed with that to the point that they waste to spend so much time in the bathroom just to make sure if there is a, a question whether they needed to use the bathroom or not, and they're going to spend so many hours into, in the meantime, they're losing everything else. So that also we got to make sure to be aware not to go crazy you do the right thing but not not in that way so here's uh from Nachman of Breslov it says there are many who would spend much time in the laboratory attempting to totally cleanse out their bodies before praying in the morning and the Rebbe, the Rebbe Nachman student says the Rebbe spoke out strongly and ridiculed this practice he said that the main thing to remember is that the Torah was not given to the ministering angels. We are human beings. God does not demand from us to act like angels, to be perfect. It is not necessary to go beyond the requirements of the law. And the codes state only that it is forbidden to pray when one actually feels the need to relieve themselves. Even in this situation, where a person really does need to relieve themselves, there are many laws cited in Shulchan Aruch, in the Code of Jewish Law, especially dealing with emergencies, or when one has no other choice. And from all this, we see that there is no need to be overly strict in this respect. One should not keep oneself from prayer and study just for the sake of a mere qualm, which in itself is unnecessary strictness and foolishness. It says the best thing is to pray as soon as you wake up in the morning. If you can easily attend to your needs, then do so. But if not, pray immediately. Even if you have a slight sensation in your bowels, it can be ignored. We shouldn't seek out such disciplines and depressing measures, as such matters are not for our time. And then, with the interesting admission, he says that he himself, the Rebbe himself, he also had the, that problem when he was young, and he realized that that was a mistake. He says the Rebbe himself had made this error in his youth, doing many unusual things to achieve bodily purity, and he went so far that he endangered his health and even his life. But finally, he realized that it was foolishness and a waste of precious time. Okay, so after taking care of this thing, that have got to be careful from not to be, uh, uh, to have religious OCD, but still, the question goes back, but after all the details that we are obligated, all the mitzvahs that we do have so much details. And this is 
the question goes back, why are the details of mitzvahs so important? So to understand this, we are going to learn an, a, a chunk of a mimer, Hasid, Hasidic discourse, from the Rebbe Rashab, the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe. He elaborates on the concept of mitzvahs. What is a mitzvah? Mitzvahs are God's desire. Now, just as God is infinite, so is his desire. The desire of God is also infinite. So when we're talking about the desire of God, you're talking about the infinite desire. And here what the Rebbe Rashab says. The desire in mitzvot is connected to God's innermost essence, higher even than God's desire to create the universe. Although the desire to create the universe is also a deep desire, it is limited insofar as God's desire to create the universe is ultimately a desire that it should be drawn down into the universe within the finite confines of the universe. Now the desire God invested in mitzvot, in the commandments, on the other hand, is that he should be drawn down without any limitation whatsoever. Rather, just as he exists above, he should become present below. You see, when you have a, a desire, we spoke about it in the Tanya classes. When you have sometimes you have a desire, you have a, you have a want. What do you want? I want to get up six o'clock in the morning because I want to go to work. Is that really what you want to what you want to do? No, you would probably prefer to sleep in. But you want to go to work. Why? Because you want to make money. You want to get the paycheck. Or you want to earn, uh, build, build your business, whatever it is. But is this really what you want? You want to get the paycheck? There is always the inner desire, the inner inner things, what you really, really, really want. The inner, inner desire. When we're talking about the creation of the universe, the creation of the world, God desired it and, and, he, and he created it. But what did... God really want. What did God really want? God wanted for us to fulfill His will. His will is the mitzvah. The, his will is to do, we should do the 613 commandments, whatever applies to us. That is the inner desire of Hashem. For that to be to happen, he created everything around us to serve that purpose so that we can fulfill his wish in this world. But let's think about it for a second. How can you say that mitzvah represents God's desire? to draw down his innermost infinite essence without any limitations. You say, that's what happens. That's what happens. We draw God's will, God's desire that has no limitations. But wait a second. If you think about it, the mitzvah themselves do have limitations. Every mitzvah has limitations. Almost every mitzvah. You have to have the matzah, you have to have a certain measurement, cannot be smaller. If it's smaller, it's no good. If you wear tefillin, tefillin you wear on the head, it has four sections in it. You cannot have more than four sections. If you add 
a fifth section, it's no longer tefillin. It's something else. So we see the mitzvahs themselves are, by definition, finite. They're limited. So how can the finite mitzvahs draw down the infinite God? So that question is asked by the Rebbe Rashab himself. He asked that question. He said, now mitzvahs are also limited. All mitzvahs have certain limitations under which they can be performed. For example, the fill-in have to be made of four scrolls in four compartments in the head in the head to fill in and one compartment in the hand to fill in. Moreover, there are many detailed laws regarding the manner of writing the scrolls, manufacturing the boxes, and putting them on. There was a video that was uh, made by Dan Allen in uh, the Business Insider. Beautiful video about the, how the tefillin is manufactured. All of the details, there's so many limitations, details, exactly what and how, precisely how it has to be. Tzitzis, Likewise, tzitzis have to be made in a specific manner. Likewise, the sukkah cannot be smaller than seven tefachim. Tefachim is like a hand breath. Cannot be shorter than seven tefachim. Or, or um, the size. And no taller than 20 amas. Cannot be taller than 20 amas. A amas is about a foot and a half. So it cannot be taller than 30 feet, etc. All these measurements and specifications, they come from the supernal desire, meaning that God desires that the mitzvahs be performed specifically in this way, etc. This translates to limitations in the divine light. For when the mitzvah is performed as specified, the light is drawn, out, drawn down. And if not... It is not. It is not drawn down. So that's so that exactly is the question. So how is it defined? A limited mitzvah able to channel the infinite godly light. We're talking about the godly light, as we said before. It is God's desire, but yet we say it has to be in a limited fashion. How can a limited mitzvah draw down this great godly light. So the Rebbe Rashab answers this, and it says as follows. In truth, this limitation is not a limitation in the light itself, meaning it does not determine how much light can be drawn down, or whether it will be more or less intense. After all, Essential infinite light is not subject to such terms. When you're talking about drawing down infinity, it is not subject, it does not, the, 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 the limitation does not affect the essential light. The essential light of Hashem cannot be affected, cannot be limited. Rather, the limitations of mitzvahs that determine only how the light, the unchanging infinite light, is drawn down. If the mitzvahs are performed in the precise way, then the light is drawn down. For that is how God decided He wants His light to be accessed. This is not because the precise details of the mitzvahs have any inherent qualities that enables them to access God's light, but rather because God decided that it should be this way, that is why this draws down. So God is not defined, is not limited by the definitions of the mitzvahs, by the limitations of the mitzvah. But since that was God's choice, that was God's will, so that is the only thing that can draw it down. 
just to use an example, if you have a particular color car that you like, you want a, a, a mint, a mint green BMW, that's what you want. And your husband comes home and he brings you a, a olive green BMW. Everything else is the same. But guess what? You, your will was not fulfilled. You got an olive green car. You wanted a mint green car. All other details can be perfect, can be exact, but that's not your will. That's not what you wanted. Hashem's desire, for whatever reason, Hashem's desire was that these mitzvahs, these commandments, should be fulfilled. So that is why the details are so crucial. So in, so in a few points, what we, are, what we just said is, number one, if a mitzvah is performed according to its precise specification, it becomes a channel for godly light. If it is done in the specific specification the way Hashem wants it. But, and if it's not, then it doesn't channel. However, point number two is the limitations of the mitzvahs do not in any way limit the amount or intensity of the godly light they access. So it's not that they limit. It is just that God chose it, that this way, this should be the one to draw the light. So the light is not limited. And number three, unlike the analogy, and when we're talking about analogy, analogy is, it can be analogy of, of, of the, of the you take, take for example an outlet. And if you have an, an appliance that takes 220 volt, you're gonna put it in, 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 in a 110, it's not gonna work. But unlike the analogy, the limitations of the mitzvahs are not inherent to the structure of the mitzvahs. Rather, they are in place because God decided it should be that way. And that's what the Rebbe Rashab continues here and says, We are obligated to, to perform the mitzvahs in a precise manner only because that is how God decided the mitzvah should be performed. Now, if God's will was that we should chop wood or something similar, we would chop wood. We would do the same mitzvah, fulfilling God's will by chopping wood. The limitations of the mitzvahs that God's will assumed a specific form and excludes other forms are not for any fathomable, fathomable reason. Rather, they are simply there, they are simply there because God willed that it should be so. So consequently, there is no limitation in the light itself. The limitation is only in how the light is accessed. The light itself remains God's essential infinite light. So when you connect to someone, when you connect, you fulfill someone's wish, even if it's a tiny detail, even if it's a tiny detail, you connect it to the very essence of the person, the essence of his will. So if we connect to the essence of Hashem, how? By this mitzvah. Why? Because God told us so. He told us exactly how to do it, whether it's in the written Torah or in the oral Torah. Because many mitzvahs, you can tell me many mitzvahs are not written clearly in the Torah. Yes, but in the Torah, God wrote clearly how things should be done how things should be understood and how we should follow the, the sages and the laws that the sages guide us. We, they should be, the, they are the will of Hashem. So therefore, all of these mitzvahs are important to the details. So 
So that's the answer. A mitzvah is limited because it is a physical means that God created through which we can fulfill His will and draw down His infinite godly light. But the action itself isn't important. The fact that it's God's will makes it significant. In another Maimah, the Rebbe Rishab explains it similarly. He says, the concept of limitation in the mitzvahs is that they determine how God's essence is drawn down, meaning that though performing the mitzvahs precisely as they should be performed, and the through performing the mitzvahs precisely as they should be performed, one draws down God's essence. In other words, how does one draw down God's essence? By performing the mitzvot in the precise and the prescribed manner, for it is God's will that His essence should be drawn down in this way. So what emerges from all of this is a fascinating paradox. What we're saying is basically that the limitations of a mitzvah are in fact the gateway to their infinity. The gateway to infinity is the limitations of the mitzvah because the limitations are placed by God himself. Each detail is critical in creating and maintaining our relationship with an infinite God. The Rebbe gives another interesting analogy, talking about uh, an analogy from an uh, engineer. When en an engineer plans, he creates a, a machine. And he writes the instruction and he, and he makes all the details of the machine. He knows exactly every detail is important because he's the engineer. So the Rebbe writes as follows. An engineer designs a machine using multiple parts. Among the various parts, some are more critical than others. Uh, uh, more cri uh, some are more cr critical than others. And there are some that to the average observer may seem entirely unnecessary. But the engineer who designed the machine knows very well the purpose of every part and how each part, even the tiniest screw, is critical to the overall function of the machine. Let's say someone comes along and says, why should I bother with the engineer's design? when building the machine. I'll do what makes sense to me. To my eyes, these little parts are unnecessary and the machine doesn't need them to function. I don't need this tiny screw and I may even add a different screw. It's quite obvious that this makes no sense. If the builder does not follow the engineer's design, and does as he or she sees fit, instead, the machine won't work properly. The only reason why the builder feels that this little screw is unnecessary is because they have no appreciation whatsoever for the machine's design. This is a precise metaphor for the creation, for creation and our mission to observe mitzvot. Just as every part of the machine is critical to its overall function, so it is with observing the mitzvot. Our connection with God is fashioned specifically through the 613 mitzvot of the Torah and the seven mitzvot of the rabbis. When a Jew adds or subtracts a mitzvah, though it may seem like trivial matter, a trivial matter, in truth, it undermines the entire relationship that forged, that's, that's uh, forged through Torah and mitzvah. 
just as the absence of even one small screw will prevent the machine from working properly. So here's another metaphor to return to the email we mentioned before from Rabbi Moss, the question he had. Look how he answers him very interestingly. Remember the question? I told him why all these details are important. He says, I never claimed to have all the answers. Because he told him he Perhaps this is the the question that the one question that he has no answer to. So they never claim to have all the answers. There are many questions that are beyond me. But it happens to be that I did answer your question. And you did get the answer. I sent the reply immediately. The fact that you didn't receive it is itself the answer to your question. You see. I sent a reply, but I wrote your email address leaving out the dot before the com. I figured that you should still receive the email, because after all, it is only one little dot missing. I mean, come on, it's not as if I wrote the wrong name or something drastic like that. Would anyone be so nitpicky? as to differentiate between yahoo.com and yahoo.com? Isn't it a bit ridiculous that you didn't get my email just because of a little dot? No, it's not ridiculous. Because the dot is not just a dot. It represents something. That dot has meaning far beyond the pixels on the screen that form it. To me, it may seem insignificant, but that is simply due to my ignorance of the ways of the internet. All I know is that with the dot, the message gets to the right destination. Without it, the message is, is lost in oblivion. Jewish practices have infinite depth, even at each nuance and detail contains a world of symbolism and every dot counts i think that was a beautiful beautiful answer perfect answer so the dot is the portal to the entire thing But I want to take it one step further. What are mitzvahs really about? So conventional wisdom says that when we do a mitzvah, we have an uplifting spiritual experience, which is often true. And that uplifting spiritual experience is the goal of the mitzvah. But this line of thinking is dangerously misinformed. You see, if we think that the mitzvah is about having a spiritual experience, uplifting spiritual experience, then you're going to be picking and choosing what mitzvah you want to do. Some people are excited about the mitzvah of Shabbat, by them Shabbat, sitting at a table. It's beautiful, beautiful mitzvah. I'm going to do that mitzvah. But think of other mitzvahs, washing the hands in the morning. Okay, I do it, I don't do it. Saying a bracha. I mean, all other mitzvahs. If it is true that when you do a mitzvah, you should also be passionate about it and try to get uplifted by it. But this, there is a major difference between the understanding of the core, the, the essence of the mitzvah. The essence of the mitzvah is not you to get uplifted and get inspired. What is the essence of the mitzvah? Is that this detail 
is what God wants. By me fulfilling that detail, that part of the mitzvah, is connecting to God's essence, God's will, God's desire. And therefore, this knowledge should inspire any mitzvah. doesn't matter what kind of mitzvah. Because every time we do a mitzvah, whatever mitzvah it is, it is connecting to the very essence of Hashem. What can be more, more inspiring than that? And here is, again, from the Rebbe Rashab, of the Sholem Dabeh, the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe. It is for this reason as well that one performs mitzvahs. When one performs mitzvahs, they must accept the yoke of heaven. When I do a mitzvah, I must do it not because it feels good, not because that mitzvah talks to me. It is because I accept the yoke of heaven. A yoke is like when they put on a on a ball to accept the 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 work of Hashem, the work of the master. We accept the yoke of heaven, which means to nullify one's own desires and rationalizations and perform the mitzvah strictly because they are God's desire. When one internalizes this, they can perform mitzvahs with great enthusiasm, knowing that they are fulfilling God's desire. When one com contemplates that mitzvahs are really God's innermost desire, the value of each mitzvah increases greatly in one's eye. And they perform the mitzvah with great pleasure and enthusiasm. When a Jew performs mitzvahs in this way, by first accepting the yoke of heaven, then they can draw down God's essential desire. And this is what the Torah says when it comes to bringing offerings to Hashem. The Torah says, Reyach nichoach, it's, it's, it, br it brings it a pleasing aroma to Hashem. A pleasing aroma, it is a spirit of satisfaction for me, says Hashem, nachat ruach, that I commanded and my will was performed. That's how Rashi interprets this verse, reyach nichoach, what is the meaning of reyach nichoach? Like nachat ruach. We're all familiar with the word nachas, nachas, right? Well, you want to have nachas, nachas from the children, nachas from the family. Nachas means good satis satisfaction, fulfillment, that your will is fulfilled, your wishes is fulfilled. Hashem has nachas. How great, what greater can it be than what we giving Hashem nachas? But if you thought that this is the end, the truth is it goes a little deeper also. And Hasidus explains that there is a reason why God gave all these mitzvahs in the limited fashion. Because if you ask the, if you ask the question, um, what is greater? Limits or infinite? You obviously say, yeah, of course, infinity is the greatest thing. Something that is infinite, it has no limitations. But when we're talking about Hashem, Hasidus explains that Hashem is so great, He is above both. He is above the limit, above the limit, and above the infinite. In the essence of God, infinity is also limits, is the same as limitations. In other words, it's like saying, when you have something um, in the in the temple, for example, right? In the temple, we mentioned this many times. One of the greatest is a godly revelation was in the holy temple, and there, there was a combination of limit and infinite. If you're saying that Hashem, if you're asking the question, does God have limits? 
does he have limits? You're going to say, no, he doesn't have limits. But if you're saying he doesn't have limits, then you're limiting him. That he's saying he's missing limits. He's lacking limits. Right? I know it's something that's beyond <laughs> our understanding. But if you think about it, you're missing limits. So he's not infinite. So that's why in the Holy Temple, there was such a godly revelation that there was limit and infinite combined. It says, The place of the Holy Ark in the Holy Temple did not take space. Which means there was a limited space in the Holy Temple, in the Holy of Holies, which was 20 cubits. And the Ark itself, the Holy Ark where God has the tablets, that itself had a limit. It was two and a half cubits. But when you measured from each side of the ark to the wall, there was 10 cubits on each side. You can't explain it. Because there was a godly revelation which is above limits and above infinity. The essence of God. That is the reason why God placed his mitzvot in the limitations that we do. He wants us to light the Shabbat candles exactly before sunset, not after sunset. He wants us to get, to do the mit the tefillin, to do it in the right way, the right measure, and the right, all of these details in mitzvot. This is God places Himself in limited fashions, because through these limitations that He places Himself, we draw down God's essence, which is above both limits and unlimited that the mitzvah is unlimited will of Hashem, and it is placed in the limited mitzvah. So it has the combination of both, because it is it comes from the very essence of God, which is above both. That is the message that the Rebbe here tells us. So mitzvah is given in a limited manner, unite the limited and the limitless expressing God's essence that transcends both. Says the Rebbe, to explain, the fact that mitzvahs were given to us in a limited manner is because the, the ultimate goal of a mitzvah is to unite the limited and limitless. It is specifically in this manner that God's essence, which transcends both limitation and limitlessness, is expressed. Therefore, it is only through God's self-limitation that we can achieve this. By God limiting the way we can access His limitlessness, we can achieve the unification of limitation and limitlessness, which is possible only in God's essence. That's the idea of the mitzvah. The mitzvah creates a place for God to be fulfilled at home in this world. God's, God's wish was to have a home in this physical world. As the Rebbe says, this idea of making a home for God in the physical realm contains both, both extremes. On the one hand, it is a place for the, limit, the limitless presence of God to be at home fully, just like a person is fully comfortable in their home. But on the other hand, the home is in this slowly finite physical world. A home for God thus combines two extremes, the limitations and limitlessness. So that explains the question in the beginning. Fo focusing on details of the mitzvah serves as a reminder of the awesome opportunity we have to unite limitation with infinity. So this gives us a whole new understanding. A whole new understanding. What does it mean? When we do a little mitzvah. How excited we should be. In every mitzvah, every mitzvah, 
And every mitzvah that we do connects us to the infinite. I just want to finish with, with a story of how one mitzvah can really save a person spiritually. There was um, a few years ago, there was a uh, here in New York. I remember it was a, a very terrible weather. They had a very bad weather in the winter, snowstorms, and and uh, and it caused the garbage to pile up. It piled up garbage, and it took them took them a number of days, a week or so, maybe more than a week. It was it was a while until they cleaned up the garbage. You probably mem- remember this, and. Um, so there was in, in Kew Garden, Queens, there was Rabbi Kalman Ep- Epstein. And he, he realized that 2 a.m. he hears the garbage truck, the noise of the garbage trucks, and he realized, oh, you've all my garbage. I forgot to take out these piles and piles of garbage. And he comes and he takes and starts schlepping out this garbage. And... Uh, and the sanitation worker pulls over and he looks at him and says, um, he says, excuse me, are you a rabbi? So he says, yes. He says, I have a question. I want to ask you something. And he says, his mother just passed away. And his uh, his brothers want to, uh, uh, what do you call it, to, burn to ashes anybody <laughs> so um, just uh, slip the word for me anyway he's uh, so his dilemma his mother to, to have a cremation basically so his his mother asked him before she passed away she wanted she wanted to be buried but the brother says, nah, no, she was not religious. Come on, let her go. We, we, we want to cremate her body. And, but he felt, he asked this rabbi, he says, you know, one thing, yes, my mother was not religious, but Friday night she would light the Shabbat candles, and I feel maybe I should bury her. And how can I do it? So basically this rabbi told him, about uh, having, he has uh, he had somebody that he know in the cemetery, in the funeral director, and he told him, "Listen, you make all the arrangements. I'm going to connect you with uh, everything, and present it to your brothers, to your, to your siblings. Maybe they'll agree." So and he, and he did that, and surprisingly, after he made all the, the preparations, they said, "Okay." even though it was much more expensive and everything, but they said, okay. So he invited this rabbi to come to speak to it at a funeral, to officiate the funeral. And um, at the funeral, they spoke about it, they spoke about it, how one mitzvah that she did, you know, got her to this point. And that's what he was thinking also. And the next thing, the next day, the next time of was if sanitation took the garbage, the rabbi wanted to talk to him, wanted to continue to invite him, whatever. And he asked where where is Pip? That was his nickname. And he said, uh, Pip, no, he doesn't work in this route. He only worked on that day when they had to collect the the extra garbage that was accumulating. So he was only on that day, and he thinks to himself, look at this. This Jewish woman was not religious at all, but one mitzvah she did. She lit the Shabbat candles. And that mitzvah kept her going. That mitzvah connected her to the point that it saved her from cremation, which is a terrible thing. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, who knows if the whole snowstorm was not made, that it should be piled up garbage to save that Jewish soul and to have that only one Jewish soul to have a Jewish burial. In any case, this is, this is uh, 
just an example, but this is true in every aspect of our lives. When we do the mitzvahs, we connect every mitzvah, connect us to the infinite will of the infinite God. Morning. We should be very soon. The light of Mashiach should be revealed. Every mitzvah adds up. And together we bring the world to bring the light to the world, which is the light of Mashiach. Thank you, Rabbi Cohen. Thank you. you. You're very welcome, Lazer. Hello, Rabbi Cohen.